This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us today over the Internet. Thank you for being with us again. You know our guest this hour for heroically landing a troubled aircraft in the Hudson River and saving all 105 passengers on board. In just a moment, Captain Sully Sullenberger will be joining us to talk about the connection between pilot experience experience and safety today. He'll also explain how many airline safety practices can be applied to the healthcare industry to reduce the number of preventable deaths. But before he joins us, as is my custom each and every week, let me tell you a little bit about this all-American hero. Chesley B. Sullenberger III was born in Denison, Texas. His father was a World War II naval veteran uh, who had a career as a dentist, and his mother was a school teacher. Sullenberger first took to the air in crop dusters. Then at the age of 18, he entered the United States Air Force Academy. There he received his bachelor's degree, his officer's commission, and the opportunity to attend Purdue University, where Sullenberger subsequently earned a master's degree in industrial psychology. He also holds a graduate degree in public administration from the University of Colorado. While serving in the Air Force, Sullenberger flew F-4 Phantom IIs and was quickly elevated to flight leader, training officer, and captain. He was also a member of the Aircraft Accident Investigation Board, an assignment which matched well with his growing interest in aviation safety. In 1980, Sullenberger began flying for U.S. Airways and their predecessors. But the turning point in Sullenberger's career came on January 15, 2009. Shortly after taking off from New York's LaGuardia Airport, the Airbus Sullenberger was in command of struck a flock of birds, leaving no option but to orchestrate an emergency landing in the Hudson River. He instructed the passengers and crew to brace for impact. Then Sullenberger successfully glided the plane into the water and rushed to make certain every one of the passengers were safely evacuated. Sullenberger inspected the empty plane twice to make sure everyone was out before being the last to evacuate. Sullenberger became an overnight hero, but to those who knew him well, it was his heroic behavior after the media had moved on, which revealed the rare leadership attributes he possessed. Sullenberger was a man of service before the incident on the Hudson, and he has worked on making the skies safer afterwards as well. In 2007, he became the CEO of Safety Reliability Methods, which provides instruction and guidance on safety, but not only in the area of airline safety, but in other industries such as health care. Sullenberger travels the world advising leaders on how to avoid, prepare for, and respond to crises. And he has written two best-selling books on the nature of leadership, Highest Duty, My Search for What Really Matters, and also Making a Difference, Stories of Vision and Courage from America's Leaders. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program one of Time Magazine's top 100 most influential heroes and the man Michael Bloomberg calls Captain Cool, Mr. Mr. Chesley Sullenberger. Thank you for joining us today, Captain. Wow. Thank you, Rebecca. Good to be with you. Well, we happen to be broadcasting today out of the San Francisco Bay Area. So let me open the program by asking you if there's any update on this Asiana Airways incident in July. You know, after the initial investigatory phase was completed and the uh, daily press briefings by NTSB Chairman Deborah Hurstman were, uh, were finished, you know, we're all waiting for the, the next round of, of releases from the National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, I think it's obvious that uh, the NTSB will be widening their focus, uh, looking at all the factors that may ultimately have come into play to cause this uh, this accident. Uh, the the organizational culture, uh, possibly the societal culture, the the standards that were used and whether or not they were adequate, uh, how the, the check airman, the instructor who was flying in the right seat was selected, how they were trained, uh, how it was that all the safeguards that should or could have been in place to prevent this occurrence uh, apparently were not sufficient uh, to prevent uh, having an airplane uh, fully functional become way too slow at a a point just seconds before touchdown. So there are many questions yet to be uh, answered, 
but ultimately they all will be. So we will ultimately know and have a very good understanding of not only what happened, not only how it happened, but most important, why it happened. And that will form the basis for the really important work that the investigators do, and that's to make recommendations going forward about how to strengthen the safety system in which we operate. Well, you make a good point. Uh, Often multiple factors conspire in an incident like this. Uh, The most glaring thing that has come out was that this airspeed was low for a plane at that altitude, uh, and particularly when you're preparing to land. So for the non-pilots that are listening today, what happens when you have insufficient airspeed on approach? The the wing uh, angle that it makes passing through the air becomes too great. The air begins to no longer uh, follow the curvature of the wing top surface smoothly. It begins to detach, and lift begins to be lost. In other words, the the mechanical action with the air flying through it that provides the airplane the lift that that overcomes the force of gravity gradually becomes less as you increase the angle too much that the wing makes as it flies through the air. And that is exactly what happened in this case. Uh, They were shockingly... Uh, 30 knots slower than their target reference speed uh, a minute, you know, in a matter of seconds before landing. That that shouldn't have happened, and so it's it's going to be the duty of the responsibility of the investigators to find out how all the human and technological systems that we have in place, all the safeguards to prevent just such occurrence, apparently did not prevent it in this case. Yeah, this is where my lack of knowledge is, I'm afraid, going to really show. But the 777 is a a very technologically advanced aircraft. So uh, what I'm trying to understand is why it wouldn't give out some kind of warning during descent that the airspeed was deficient. I I mean, we we now have cars that parallel park themselves and slam on the brakes all by themselves when they detect an obstacle. So am I missing something here? Well, clearly... uh Several things were missed by by people involved in this, and so. It, but it's important that we simply not blame individual people and leave intact whatever inherent risks and latent conditions there were in this system in which they operated. So it's it's important that we widen the focus to look at how this particular crew got there, or else if we don't uh, uh, solve the underlying conditions, then we simply leave in place traps for the next unsuspecting crew to come along. So, but you're right, there should have been call-outs made by the, by the other pilot, the pilot monitoring the pilot flying about airspeed and altitude, and when these, these target speeds were not attained, when they, were, uh, when they got too slow, call-outs should have been made, action should have been taken, people should have intervened long before you got to the point, seconds before a touchdown, when it was unrecoverable. Uh, and there should have been uh, warnings about this. Um, one of the, uh, without getting too deep in the details, one of the uh, uh, ground-based navigational devices that typically at large airports is normally available to you uh, is an ins- instrument landing system, an ILS. It consists of two components, a lateral guidance beam and a vertical guidance beam. And the vertical guidance beam was out of service because of runway construction going on at the airport at that time. Wow. Had that been operational and had the, the pilots chosen to to uh, tune it in and monitor it, it would also have provided uh, a too low, below glide slope warning to them. So there, there were several things that might have been uh, available to them that apparently were not, and there, there still were some warnings that should have been available to them that, that would have helped them to realize that they were um, getting dangerously slow, dangerously low, too close to the runway. So this is sounding like back to several factors may have conspired, including uh, the airport construction and the fact that uh, certain safety uh, backup measures weren't operational at the time. Is that right? That's one of the things that they are aware of and they may mm-hmm. consider in their investigation. Uh, but it's important to know that the the pilot in command is always ultimately responsible for everything that happens with an airplane. Mm -hmm. In this case, it would have been the pilot in the right seat, the the check airman, the the training captain. And they should always make sure that all the parameters are attained, that everyone's performance is sufficient, that that all the procedures are being followed. And if they are not, there are certain thresholds that we have to have uh, a certain amount of performance on the airplane and and people. And if they aren't, we're we're required to to abandon the approach and go around and set it up and and fly it over and and get it right. Absolutely. Well, we unfortunately, we have to go to a short commercial break now. But when we come back, we're going to talk about whether pilot training played a role. You're listening to the Costa Report. 
This Legal Minute is brought to you by Nolan, Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Experienced attorneys providing professional legal services to the Central Coast for 85 years. Hello, this is attorney Stephen Wagner with your Legal Minute. Have you ever said to yourself there ought to be a law for that? Well, often there is. In this segment, I will address the issue of social media and hiring practices, and specifically the potential employer's right to snoop around in social media networks to gather information about the potential employee. From the employer's perspective, social networking sites must seem like a treasure trove or petri dish, overflowing with valuable information. The hot-button legal issue that has arisen recently relates to the employer's request, or worse yet, demand, for the candidate's password and or username. It is this conduct by the employer that has sparked outcry and controversy based on privacy rights, and this has led to legislation and the enactment of laws that now prohibit employers from making such demands or requests. Such is the case in California and several other states. It would now seem that the lid has been placed back on the Petri dish. However, it is important to note that employers still have a right to access all public information. That is, anything the potential or current employee chooses to share, publish, or make public. In other words, these laws do not protect job seekers from their own stupidity or indiscretions that they decide to gloat about by publishing their escapades on the World Wide Web. So it seems that discretion is still the better part of valor. This is Stephen Wagner, and that's your Legal Minute. Brought to you by Nolan, Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Selected in 2013 as one of the top law firms in the United States by Martindale Hubble. If you want to work until you drop, reduce your standard of living in retirement, or lose more of your hard-earned money in the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. A free report is now available that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. This report reveals how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street casino, and how to get the money you need when you need it, simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. And it beats the pants off any IRA or 401k. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to bankonyourself.com right now. That's bankonyourself.com, www.bankonyourself.com. Hey, all you Dead Doctors Don't Lie fans, this is Justin Baker. If you missed the Doc Wallach Seminar in January right here in Santa Cruz, then now is your chance to see him again. Dr. Wallach is going to be doing a Central California Health Tour the first week in September 2013. You'll have four opportunities to attend his world-renowned health lecture, which is helping people from around the globe reverse disease. Doc will be at the Pacific Cultural Center at 1307 Seabright Avenue in Santa Cruz on Tuesday, September 3rd. The doors open at 6.30 p.m. On Wednesday, September 4th at 6.30 p.m., we will be in Modesto at Soul Harvest Warfare. Worship Center, 4718 Greenleaf Court, followed by two lectures on Thursday, September 5th at 1030 a.m. at Mosswood Park Great Hall at 3612 Webster Street in Oakland. And the last event of the health tour will be in Sacramento the evening of September 5th at 630 p.m. at the Church of Scientology at 1007 6th Street. Don't miss these life-changing events. Seating is limited, so contact me today at 831-331-9523. That's 831-331-9523 to reserve your free VIP seats. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest is airline safety expert and the hero who safely landed in the Hudson River and saved all passengers on board before being the last to evacuate his plane, Captain Sully Sullenberger. So so let's talk about uh, pilot training for a moment. Uh, My father was a pilot, and like you, he started on crop dusters, and then later he joined the Air Force. Um, He had a, a short commercial career before being recruited overseas by the CIA, and and he would often tell me that he was worried about airline safety because a new generation of pilots didn't have any military training and also didn't seem to quite understand how the plane actually worked. 
And so he claimed that they couldn't really solve problems uh, on their feet in an emergency situation. And and he even complained to me that many of them couldn't do fuel calculations right because they were so dependent on electronics to give them the answer. And it really scared him. And, and it also scared some of his old timer friends. So how about you? I mean, are pilots trained to think on their feet anymore? They absolutely have to be. And the degree to which they will be is dependent upon all of us and making sure that the next generation of pilots has the same well-learned fundamental flying skills that are so deeply internalized that they're immediately accessible in a crisis even decades after you learn to fly. You have to have in-depth knowledge of, of every part of the airplane, all of its component systems, fuel, electrical, hydraulic, air conditioning, pressurization. And then on top of that, you have to have an in-depth knowledge of all the automation technologies that there's more and more of these days. And for those who think that a, a highly automated airplane is simpler to fly, easier to fly, and requires less knowledge or skill than a more traditional airplane, that's simply wrong. Because you have to understand how the technology works. You have to be in complete control of it. You have to understand all its intricacies, its nuances, when it will automatically change from one phase or one mode of operation to another. You have to know when to use it. You have to know what, how much technology is appropriate to use at any given level of the flight. And on top of that, you have to have skill and judgment and experience to handle the unexpected. You know, one of the most difficult things about being an airline pilot is we work so hard to make it routine, and we do. We, we have, in fact, the last passenger fatality in a large U.S. jet airliner was in November 2001, over a decade ago. And yet, in spite of that, we have to remain vigilant and avoid complacency because we never know on any given day when we might face some ultimate challenge. On January 15, 2009, I'd been flying for 42 years at 20,000 hours and never even experienced the failure of a single engine in flight. And yet I was suddenly confronted with the ultimate challenge of a lifetime, a situation I'd never trained for. In fact, in our flight simulators, you can't practice a water landing. It's not possible. Believe it or not, the only training we'd ever gotten for a water landing was a theoretical classroom discussion. So we had, as it turned out, 208 seconds to take what we did know, apply it in a new way, and solve a problem we'd never seen before and get it right the first time. And, and you had to land with no simulator training and one discussion in a classroom. You had to figure out how to put that plane down. Yes. Based upon my experience, I had to take what I did know and apply it in a new way to solve this problem. And we did. And that, that is the crux of being an airline pilot, knowing it, having such a, a well-internalized paradigm on how to solve any crisis in an airplane that you can adapt and you can improvise. And that's the that's what humanity brings to the equation. You know, technology, as wonderful as it is, can only do what's been foreseen and for which has been programmed. The humans have to innovate and in real time. And so it takes both. But at the same time, you have to have, you know, people who have this, these well-learned fundamental flying skills. You have to be able to do the middle math. You have to have rules of thumb uh, to make sure that the, that the answers that the technology is giving you are, are reasonable, uh, or if it fails, how to how to come up with a quick alternative. It, it, it takes both, and so we need to make sure that, that we pass on this tacit institutional knowledge to the next generation. If we don't, then some of the lessons that we've learned at great cost, lessons literally bought with blood, learning from previous accidents, will have forgotten, will have been forgotten, and will have to be learned again. And we can't afford to do that. That's right. I mean, standardization is essential for consistency, but we all know you can't standardize for every eventuality. That's just absolutely impossible. But, but you know, paradoxically, mm-hmm. it was it was this procedural standardization uh, that we've accomplished in the last 20 or 30 years. But, you know, we've, we've gone way past the, the bad old days where captains were cowboys or gods with a little g who ran their cockpits by whim with insufficient consideration of best practices. Some wouldn't yes. use a checklist. Some ne- never listened to the co-pilot. It was a horror show, and the accident rate reflected that. In the last 40 years, we've, we've done much better about making everybody standardized, making everybody follow the best practices. And that, almost paradoxically, has been the foundation on which you can then innovate to solve a sudden crisis you haven't trained for. Right. I I think a lot of what we're talking about, too, is just having so much training and so much knowledge that your instincts kick in and you're able to put things together very quickly in short order. It takes dedication. It takes professional discipline. It takes people who have learned and have a deep understanding of the fact that good enough isn't. You have to constantly be in a learning mode. You have to constantly 
uh, strive for excellence. You have to try to make each flight better than the previous one. You have to, to debrief yourself and hold yourself accountable to a high professional standard. You can't be a slacker. You can't say, well, it's not in the book. I must not need to know it. You have to understand every part of your airplane, every every part of your, of your profession intimately because you never know when that may happen to you. And that brings me to a point where it, it seems like just in, culturally we have adopted this weird idea that whatever's required, we reverse engineer and say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work to that standard. We're almost like this is what the job requires, so now I'm only going to go up to that particular standard. And, and that indicates to me a certain lacking of always wanting to be better. Forget what's required of the job. You know, what's required of you as a person? You should constantly be striving to get knowledge, to be better. I remember my dad, you know, I I talk about my dad a lot because he really inspired us to strive and to be better and not to relax on what we learned yesterday. And at the time I was going to college, uh, everybody was getting these HP calculators. I'm pretty much dating myself, but that was the big deal, was whether your parents would buy you one of these programmable HP calculators. And I remember coming home and saying, yeah, we're doing all these math problems and he'd and he turned the calculator off and he said I want you to do it longhand and then I want you to stop doing it longhand and I'm going to ask you and I want you to give me an estimate a rough estimate of what the answer would be because you need to be able to do that in a couple of seconds just using logic and the math skills you have and you because you're so familiar with the math that you should know it instinctively that number is wrong And we don't have that anymore. It's like people are going to go through nine procedures and push this button and do this, and they're not really thinking about the big picture. And and when you know something's wrong, I mean, you're you're landing an Airbus with 155 people on water that you've never done before and never even been trained to do. You had to, all, all cells in your brain had to be firing. And, and they were, and it, it was the most difficult challenge of my life and and I knew it immediately in the first seconds and my body responded in a very normal human physiological way to this stress my body knew it was a challenge of a lifetime I could feel it in the first seconds as my pulse and my blood pressure shot up and my perceptual field narrowed in tunnel vision because of it but I had to you know, ignore my body's response and do my job anyway. And it was hard. It absolutely interfered with my performance. Um, it was such a shock after 30 years of routine airline flying where we worked so hard, you know, to be, to plan and, and anticipate and have alternatives for every course of action. And absolutely. Every, every by anything. This was, this yeah. was a sudden shock. Um, so, but you're right. It, it, it's a personal dedication. Mm-hmm. And, well, unfortunately, we have to go to another break now, but when we come back, we're going to find out how the rules which govern airline safety apply to other mission-critical professions. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Are you looking for ideas to create a more balanced meal plan? As one of the world's largest providers of fresh fruits and vegetables, Dole makes it easy to eat the right foods. From a wide variety of salad blends and all-natural salad kits to fresh-cut vegetables and a rainbow of your favorite fresh fruit, Dole delivers good nutrition naturally. But Dole goes beyond just offering healthy fruits and vegetables. Dole has their own nutrition institute that gives you the knowledge and tools you need to make smart choices about your nutrition and health. Visit www.dole.com for more information about the Dole Nutrition Institute. Be sure to sign up for their e-newsletter to receive delicious recipes, tips, and articles to help you make your meals the best they can be. Visit www.dole.com for more. The sun is shining, which means it's time to get out and test drive an eco-friendly, fuel-efficient Ford energy car or truck from North Bay Ford in Santa Cruz. Hello, I'm Jeff Winterholder. North Bay Ford is your locally owned dealership with low overhead, friendly small town values, and great deals on new Ford trucks and utility vehicles. Here are two kinds of eco-friendly, energy-efficient Fords you can find right now at North Bay Ford. Get the best of both worlds with a C-Max or Fusion Energy Plug-In Hybrid. Each gives you 20 miles or so on electricity and then converts to a gasoline-electric hybrid. 
or go all in with the all-electric Focus and say goodbye to gasoline forever. Two kinds of eco-friendly, energy-efficient Fords you can find right now at North Bay Ford. Make hay while the sun shines in a new eco-friendly, fuel-efficient Ford car or truck from locally owned North Bay Ford. Head on over or call or click for a bid, 1999 Soquel Avenue, Santa Cruz, or on the web at NorthBayFord.com. Planes, trains, and automobiles. The 49th Annual Watsonville Fly-In and Air Show is bigger and better than ever. Labor Day weekend, August 30th through September 1st at Watsonville Municipal Airport. More than just an air show. It's experimental planes, retro rides, and wild horsepower. Don't miss Jetpack Man, Spectacular Warbirds, Roller Derby Girls Action, plus a Richie Valens tribute band called Backyard Blues Band with his brother Mario Valens, brother of Richie Valens. Enjoy pancake breakfast, spaghetti dinner, and more. And talk about car fun. Be part of the action by displaying your smooth ride. And save money on all Friday night's dollar night. Come to the grand opening preview on Friday, August 30th for a $1 drive-in night featuring the movie, trains, planes, and automobiles. It's the all-new Watsonville Fly-In Labor Day weekend at the Watsonville Municipal Airport. Visit watsonvilleairshow.org. Whoa. The moment my son saw a redwood tree. It's huge! Is the moment I knew that for him. You can't even see the top of that thing! Even the sky has no limit. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Learn about forests near you and discover cool things to do when you go. Your moment is out there. Find it at discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. For the last 60 years, Coast Paper and Supply has been serving locals and businesses for all their cleaning and paper supply needs. With an 1,800-square-foot showroom and nearly 5,000 products, you'll find everything you're looking for in the way of janitorial supplies, retail and industrial packaging, and disposable food service products for business or home. Not to mention their huge selection of boxes and shipping supplies. Their family-owned and operated business is located at 151 Josephine on River Street in Santa Cruz. Call 831-423-3350 or visit Coast Paper Supply Inc.com, a proud member of Think Local First. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is American hero, Captain Sully Sullenberger. And before the break, we were talking about how you were able to quash the immediate physiological response to fear and crisis and draw upon every bit of experience and knowledge that you had to solve a real-time crisis and all within 208 seconds. Now, anyone who listens regularly to this program or has read my book, they know that I'm a big fan of looking for solutions in industry industries outside of the one that we're working in, industries that have similar characteristics. And you see a lot of parallels between airline safety and healthcare. So can you speak to us about that for a moment? Absolutely. And I've I've uh, become a, a, an international speaker and I've talked to groups as diverse as nuclear power operators to financial risk managers and, and oil and gas explorers, uh, you know, chemical industry, everything in between, including a lot of medical audiences. And the more diverse groups I talk to, the more industries and domains I, I speak about, the more similarities I see. And that really shouldn't be surprising because what we are talking about ultimately is improving human performance and system performance in complicated systems that, that all involve inherent risk. Uh, and, and in every case, uh, in every industry, in aviation and medicine and every other, safety begins in the boardroom. It begins with effective leadership, making real the core values of the organization in authentic ways in, in every action every day. But for it to be possible at the bedside, it has to be existing in the boardroom. And, uh, and, and that's what we're trying to do is to, to make all the, the lessons we have learned in safety and aviation um, over the last uh, three or four decades transferable to other domains. And we're doing that in a lot. A lot of people are doing that in medicine. Uh, just one example you may know about is, is surgical checklists, uh, mm-hmm. formalizing best practices. It's surprising to a lot of people that this hasn't been done much sooner. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you a quick anecdote about a, a colleague, a, an airline pilot who's now retired, but with whom I flew several years ago. Uh, his wife uh, writes uh, as a technical technical writer for several uh, medical organizations, and. She was uh, reading a book 
called Internal Bleeding by Dr. Dr. Robert uh, Wachter, who's at uh, UCSF, one of the, the patient safety pioneers, about just these issues. And on the cover illustration is a, an image of an X-ray showing a hemostat, a clamp, mm-hmm. left inside a patient's uh, abdomen. And the airline pilot, uh, her husband, seeing this illustration, looked at the cover, realizing what it was and what she was reading about it, and he said uh, the checklist should have caught that based upon his education and his aviation background. Yes. And this was in the early 2000s. And his wife said, well, there isn't a surgical checklist. And he said, there has to be. And she said, no, there's not. And she said, there must be. You couldn't do something as complicated as surgery without a checklist. And she said, well, they don't. He he simply couldn't believe that a a cheap, simple intervention that had been used in aviation uh, now for almost 80 years since the mid-30s wasn't commonplace in the early 2000s in, in medicine. So those are the kinds of challenges that we're up against. Now, you have made the point that if you compare the number of patients lost to preventable deaths and the number lost to airline accidents, patient losses are equivalent to three large jetliners crashing every day with no survivors. And and I wonder, how is it that we've accepted those kinds of losses in health care so long? It's shocking. Well, again... Healthcare professionals are as dedicated as any. They want the best things for their patients. But if airline pilots worked in a system that was as fragmented uh, and inherently um, flawed as the medical system in which they operate, we would have similar outcomes. Um, well, first so- of all, what passenger would ever fly if three planes were crashing? Every day. That, that's my point exactly, is that there are still too many of us who consider these, these uh, preventable medical deaths, some 200,000 is estimated per year in this country alone, mm-hmm. when you consider what are, consi- uh, what are thought to be medical errors, but of which I think are really system failures, and what are called health care-associated conditions, things like hospital-acquired infections. That is the equivalent, like you said, you know, three airliners crashing per day. And if that happened in my domain, (laughs) we would see what happened after September 11, 2001. There would be a nationwide ground stop. Uh, There would be uh, congressional hearings, a a presidential commission. The NTSB would investigate fine root causes. No one would fly until we had solved the issues. But in medicine, because it happens one at a time and not a hundred at a time, and it's not on CNN with vivid images, because in medicine, the failures are often buried. it's it's just not being done. Now, now you've suggested yeah. that the medical industry could establish could establish something like the National Transportation Safety Board, but one for healthcare, so that if something causes patient trauma or death, it could be investigated and then fixed. So, how has that idea been received? There are there are units, there are hospitals that have multidisciplinary teams who review cases. But it's not enough, and much of what is being done either is incomplete or is um, not coordinated. Uh, the results are not widely disseminated. We in aviation have had the the uh, benefit of an NTSB formal lessons learned approach for decades, mm-hmm. where an independent federal agency reviews these seminal accidents. Uh, they make recommendations that are widely disseminated, but they're locally actionable, and and something could be done uh, to to study select representative uh, events in medicine, uh, have recommendations that can be widely applied um, and and still be locally actionable. And shouldn't this be part of health care reform in your view? You know, whether it's a government uh, agency or whether it's uh, something else that's been done successfully in aviation, it's a government industry partnership uh, Mm -hmm. as the commercial aviation safety team cast was that was formed in the in the uh, 1990s and in 10 years reduced the airline accident rate by 83 percent by proactively searching out and mitigating uh, risks. Um, it, this this approach has been proven to be successful in aviation. I think it can be equally successful in medicine, uh, but it, it requires culture change. It requires effective leadership. It requires hospitals knowing what their numbers are. Everybody in a hospital should know what their infection rates are, what 
the other, what the compli- complication rates are. And it also uh, involves what you call a cultural change, because one of the programs that I heard about from my father, uh, which I think the, either the NTSA or FAA put into place, it, it was really effective. It was an amnesty program where pilots could report mistakes and errors which occurred without worrying about any retribution for reporting the mistake. And yeah, that was a problem. way in which information about problems which were reoccurring could be amassed, and the person okay. reporting it didn't worry about any punitive action. I'm not so sure that these boards and hospitals understand that. They call themselves disciplinary boards. I mean, that's enough to scare you from reporting an error. Well, we, we had to transition it in aviation from the bad old days in the culture of blame, where, uh, you know, 50 years ago, the, uh, the accident investigation was basically what happened, who was the last one there, blame them, case closed. Uh, we must have lots of bad pilots because we keep on having crashes. And when you do that, like I said, you only leave the same traps in place for the next unsuspecting pilot crew to come along. So we've gone beyond that. We look for all the contributing factors. We, we begin to, to change the culture at the airline, and that was one of the things prior to the flight four years ago that resulted in the Hudson landing, of which I was most professionally proud, and that was what my involvement 20 years ago with changing the cockpit culture at my airline along with dozens of other pilots to teach them these human skills, these leadership and team building skills to create uh, well-defined roles and responsibilities that every team member had, pilot and flight attendant and mechanic and dispatcher alike, to create a shared sense of responsibility for the outcome among all the team members, to open channels of communication, to flatten the hierarchy, to make captains approachable. So they'll listen to team members bringing up important safety issues that they may not be acting effectively on yet. So, uh, it, and, it, and I'd uh, like to see some point. kind of amnesty program in place as well, where doctors don't feel that they're putting themselves at risk for any kind of medical lawsuits so that this data can be aggregated right. and actionable. We've had that in ni- we've had that since 1975 in aviation, the mm-hmm. aviation safety reporting system, ASRS. And it's just what you said. It's de-identified data. We give incentives to, re- to individuals to report, pilots, mechanics, air traffic controllers, flight attendants. We have amassed a huge uh, big data set that we can mine for, uh, for trends, look for risks, Absolutely. issue safety alerts, uh, and make it uh, widely disseminated so everybody can have the same access to the same information. And we do need that in the medical profession. Uh, absolutely. I think everybody will call in during the second hour to talk about that. Uh, we have to take our last break, so stay right where you are. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars. Now, everyone knows that my favorite is your Pinot Noir, but Caraccioli's known for a lot more than that. It's really the bubbles that kind of differentiates what we're doing in the area as opposed to a lot of our peers. And the way that we looked at it was there's great Chardonnay and Pinot Noir fruit in the Santa Lucia Highlands in the greater Monterey County. And we wanted to be able to utilize those grapes and showcase them in a little bit different light. And to do that comes a little bit of a laborious process in terms of making sparkling wine and doing A little it. bit? A lot of bit, <laughs> but still definitely worth the trouble and worth the wait. Um, we're currently selling 2006 and 2007 sparkling wines in the beginning of 2013. So it kind of tells you the time invested as well as all of the different techniques that we use and Michelle implements to ensure that we're delivering a quality product. Thank you for being with us again, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. What does your website do for you? Does it simplify doing business and automate routine tasks? Does it connect with your target audience and bring new business? If you can't answer yes, then you need to contact Sunstar Media. Located on the Monterey Peninsula for over 17 years, Sunstar Media has developed websites for startups, brick-and-mortar stores, to corporations on the stock market. What makes Sunstar different is the customization that goes into every site, tailored to each client's unique needs and vision. Sunstar's experienced pros keep you ahead of the game with their custom fit development process for website applications that cater to your company's specific needs. Learn more at sunstarmedia.com. Mention you heard this ad on the Rebecca Costa Show and get a free web analysis report on your current site or a free web consultation for your next project. Let's discuss how Sunstar can help you. Reach out to us at sunstarmedia.com. Yes, it is loud. 
road. It is raucous. It is fun. So get up and go for it. Take the family, take the friends, take the entire neighborhood to the rip-roaring racing fun at Ocean Speedway in Watsonville. Friday night, it's Ocean Sprint Night number 14 and the 53rd Johnny Key Classic with Racers Reunion. That means loud and raucous racing with 360 sprint cars, modified sport mods, and wingless sprints. Adult $17, senior 65 plus for 16, kids 6 to 12 for 13, and families for only $55. Details at OceanSpeedway.com. Ocean Speedway is located at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds, just two miles east of downtown Watsonville on Highway 152. Get up and go for the loud, raucous, rip-roaring racing fun this Friday night at Ocean Speedway. Have you ever stopped to think what kinds of people are the most powerful, most godlike? Some might say kings, queens, politicians, organized crime bosses, and other union leaders. Others might say brain surgeons, heart surgeons, and those who have the power to heal and prolong life. But what about judges? Yeah, judges who have the power to alter entire societies and populations on a whim. It's been many years since KSEO presented an opportunity for you to talk to a judge, but that's exactly what we we will do on the next KSCO special featuring retired Santa Cruz County Judge Robert Yonts, who has unlimited stories to tell and experiences to relate. Very little, if anything, will be off limits to discuss. So collect your questions and prepare to join us this Saturday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, right here on Where Else Do You Get the Chance to Talk Candidly with a Real Live Judge, where thousands of others can hear you radio AM 1080 KSCO. <laughs> Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Captain Sully Sullenberger. You've written two books, uh, in my view, uh, that speak to leadership across all industries. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, what do you say to folks who are disappointed in the leadership they see today? For example, gridlock in our nation's capital. We, we seem to be holding our breath and waiting for someone to rise above the bickering and lead us to safety. What do you say to those folks? You know, I'm basically optimistic. I, I think that uh, we always seem to survive in spite of ourselves sometimes. Uh, and it, it sometimes seems as though we get the politicians that we deserve because of the, the system that we've created and the way we react to sound bites and to negative ads and, and other things like that. Mm-hmm. But there are people who have the right values and are or people like I profiled in the book that came out last year, Making a Difference, people who are willing to serve a cause greater than themselves, who can, can put their egos aside and do things for the greater group, group and not for their own needs or their own desires. Uh, and there are people all around us who are doing that on a daily basis. They just haven't been as publicly tested as we were that day four years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the other point I make is that um, these things are not uh, – you know, given us from birth, these are leadership techniques that we can learn and, and, and that we can all make ourselves more effective at work, at school, at home uh, by being more effective leaders. Um, it's, it's something that can be learned. And, and, uh, and no matter what your station in life, uh, no matter uh, you know, what you, whether you have a fancy title or a big job or not, there is some part of the world that some, some sphere of influence that you do control, you can control. And when each one of us chooses to uh, to do the best we can to make good come in our part of the world, it can make a difference. Absolutely. It, one of the things that troubles me a little bit is that this old idea of leading by example, it seems to be going to by the wayside. And I'm troubled by that because to me, leading by example is being the first to make the sacrifice before you ask others who you're leading to make it. Oh, and I, I just don't see enough of that. I, I see that everybody wants to get theirs, and and particularly the people at the top. You know, imagine how much we would respect our government leaders if they were to say, you know what, I'm not going to vote myself a raise because the economy's not doing well. And you know what? The affordable health care applies to me and my children as well, as opposed to I've got a separate system. Um, it, it just you know, we're being asked to make sacrifices, but leaders themselves don't seem to want to make those sacrifices. They're asking everyone to work longer hours, two jobs, cut back, 
attack on energy, and then they don't do it themselves. You know, this is why people become so negative and they become so cynical. They don't see leaders doing the very thing the leaders are asking them to do. There are a few who are doing the right thing, but you're right. When when it's it, when it's like that, it's obvious that we are not all in this together, and that the rules are slanted to benefit to certain industries or certain kinds of people, uh, and that opportunities are not as widespread for everybody else. And so, I think one of the things that we need to do, and I talked to a, a number of prominent people, including Robert Reich, uh, in in one of the. Cha- of the Making a Difference book that came out last year about just this issue, mm-hmm. and uh, that we need to have incentives in in every in every public sphere, in government, in in business, in the financial world, to encourage more public good, because left to its own devices, sometimes the the private businesses aren't willing, especially in the short term, to do things that are that are good for the general welfare, and I think it. it it requires great leadership, and it requires taking a longer view, quite frankly, because when you change the time horizon, then you begin to change the way people view questions and, and problems, and you begin to, to view, change the way they answer them. And so we need to have more leaders who can do things for the right reasons and not for their own needs, and more leaders who can take a longer view, at least occasionally. And that I would, would hope that they would use themselves first as an example of the kind of behavior that they're asking out of other people. Yeah, you know, uh, character, character matters. You know, I, I don't. You bet. I, I'm, I, I'm not one of those people who thinks that you can be a scumbag in your private life and and uh, and be a good leader. I think it's uh, it's either not possible or it's very difficult or it affects your pub- your private life can affect your public life in important ways. Yeah, a- absolutely. Now, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I you know I can't let you go without asking you is that. After the the incident on the Hudson River and writing these books and traveling around, uh, meeting a lot of people who I'm sure can't r- wait to rush up and shake your hand because you have become a, a very public and and uh, um, and a, a well respected national hero. Uh, this has got to have changed your life. You were always this person who was dedicated to service and serving your fellow human, but this had to have had a pretty big impact on your life, I would imagine. Yeah, it it changed um, my life instantly, completely forever, uh, or if not forever, for a long time, and my family as well. In fact, everyone on the airplane and their families to varying degrees, but I think since I've become the public face of this, in spite of my best efforts to remind everyone it was a team effort that day, um, I'm the one who's been affected by it the most, and it it was, we think of it as a two- two-part process, the, the trauma of the flight of the event itself, and then the trauma of the immediate aftermath and suddenly becoming a public figure and having to rise to the occasion and developing the skills to be able to do that. And this was not my natural temperament. I had to really stretch and grow literally in a matter of days to be able to do it, to speak in public confidently and to mm-hmm. to uh, be on the public stage. But then you know what else? I, I when it first became obvious to us that unlike most stories, this one was not going to fade away, this one because of the way it touched people's lives and the time in our world's history during the financial meltdown where it seemed like everything was going wrong, that people had lost faith in humanity, this gave them hope. And because of that, because of the fact that this is going to last for a while, I felt an intense obligation to continue to try to make good come from it to in every way I could for as long as I could. And that mission continues you know, you know, with the books, with the speaking, to try to remind people that leadership matters, that character matters, that, that each of us has the ability to change at least a part of the world on a daily basis. And what makes me hopeful and makes me so happy is that someone like yourself has a larger platform to affect change. Uh, it's, and, and you know, yes, it was a terrible incident that elevated you to have that public platform. But I'm so grateful that it happened and that it was you who took advantage of it. I, I can't even imagine the growth that had to have happened as the media was scrambling to get every inch of you. But I'm really happy that it happened to you. So now before we run out of time, I know listeners are going to be emailing me to find out where your website is and how they can keep up on uh your ongoing work. So do you have a website or are you on social media? Yes, sullysullenberger.com. 
Uh, and of course, we're on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I blog on occasion, uh, and all the, the things that are doing we're doing currently, either with media or giving back with the, the uh, charitable organizations I support. It's all on SullySullenberger.com. Well, we're all out of time, uh, but it's been an honor to speak to you. And before we say goodbye, I'd like to thank you for being a role model on what it means to put service ahead of self. Thank you for being with us, Captain Sullenberger. My pleasure. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you'd like to comment on today's program, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or send me a note on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. We are pretty much all over the Internet and easy to find, so let us know how you feel about today's interview with Captain Sullenberger. And if you missed the full interview or any of our other interviews, you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from Apple iTunes, Podbeam, and our new YouTube channel, as well as our website. I also want to thank listeners who have purchased their copy of The Watchman's Rattle and taken the time to email me and write me letters, and I can't thank you enough. It it means a lot to hear from you, and thank you for your wonderful reviews online and for supporting the Costa Report through your book purchases. And for those of you who might be looking for answers as to why gridlock and a massive confusion between facts and unproven beliefs always precedes irrational policy, well, there's still time to grab an autographed copy of the Watchman's Rattle from our website at RebeccaCosta.com. So do it now while it's fresh on your mind. Again, I want to take a moment to thank Captain Sullenberger for all of his good work. Um, You know, he is an inspiring individual, and I hope that you'll take a moment to go to his website and take a look at his blogs. Uh, I enjoyed reading them, and I think uh, if you're a listener of the Costa Report, you'll enjoy that as well. Now, my guest next week uh, is former United States Secretary of Transportation, Mr. Norman Mineta. And we didn't plan it this way, but Mr. Mineta was available, so we grabbed the chance to talk to him on the heels of talking to Captain Sullenberger. He'll be here uh, to discuss the need for additional security measures, especially where porous airport perimeters are concerned. So don't miss Norman Mineta next week right here on the Costa Report, the one program you can count on to put principles ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for the second hour of the Costa Report when we hear what you have to say about our conversation with Captain Sully Sullenberger. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. If electricity flows through it, you can save a lot of money by doing it yourself with the help of the experts at Santa Cruz Electronics. Hello, Charlie Friedman here. Listen to the things your friends and neighbors are doing for themselves with the help of Santa Cruz Electronics. Xbox 360 repair. Solar energy kits. Musical Tesla coil. Video output for my home media center. Building a new server. Repairing a student radio station. More RAM and a sound card. DSL line. Network printing, scanning, and faxing for dentists. Replacing antivirus on 12 machines. Wireless network for court reporter agency. Diagnosing sound card problem. Building a 5 kilowatt amplifier. Ham radio antenna. If electricity flows through it, you can save a lot of money by doing it yourself with the help of the experts at Santa Cruz Electronics. Voted best electronics store two years running. Call Santa Cruz Electronics today at 831-479-5444 or visit at 2808 SoCal Avenue in Santa Cruz. Do it yourself and save money with the help of Santa Santa Cruz Electronics. 
from San Jose to Salinas. Red Hot News Talk, AM 1080, KSCO Santa Cruz.